This is the IDP After Show. Welcome to the IDP After Show. I'm your host, Jeff Pumzal. The NFL Draft is less than a week away, and if you're like me, you couldn't be more excited for these players to have actual, real homes. It's almost the end of mock draft season. Tonight, I'm joined by Jason King, who is a writer over at DLF, as well as for the IDP show. Jason, how are you doing? Oh my gosh, I'm so ready for this draft to get here. <laughs> we've, we've, uh, we've analyzed all we can about these guys. It's time to see what the real NFL thinks. Paralysis by analysis, right? Yep. So That's right. So, well, for this episode of the IDP After Show, Jason and I are going to briefly talk about some of the prospects that we like and a couple realistic landing spots for them based on their prospect ratings and draft capital for the NFL teams. And then we're going to take it one step farther and we're going to say if those players were to be drafted by those teams, what rookie pick would we feel comfortable drafting them with? If you're listening to this podcast, we don't have to tell you that landing spot in IDP is a little more important than it is with their offensive counterparts. With that said, Jason, Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do this. Yes. So diving right into the defensive line position, we're going to take a couple of defensive tackles for those of us that play in defensive tackle required leagues. Jason, who's a defensive tackle that is intriguing to you? Well, I'm just going to talk about the top guy on my board, uh, and that's Byron Murphy II. Um, Honestly, the only thing about Murphy that's not to love is that length and the weight so he's six foot uh, with arms that are 32 and three eighths inches. And he weighs just a shade under 300 pounds. So all that's a little bit less than ideal, but it's not a killer. And uh, at least he's thick, like all over. Um, watching him on the field, uh, there's just a lot to love. I mentioned this um, when we hopped on for the early IDP mock way back in March. Uh, he is so quick off the line. He just explodes when the ball is snapped. Uh, he's really quick laterally. He's got good hand moves. He plays very strong. You want to see him at the three tech, of course, but he can also shed. He can make a tackle when he's two gapping over an offensive lineman. Uh, so he's he's my top guy there at defensive tackle. I've got him um, as an ideal landing spot. Uh, I don't know if he'll slip quite this far. But 119 going there to the Rams, uh, I'd kind of hate to do that to the guy. That's a lot of pressure on somebody to come in on the heels of Aaron Donald's retirement. But I do think that would be fun to see him line up next to Kobe Turner uh, for uh, the next several years. So if that happens for fantasy, uh, if we're talking like a super flex league, uh, defensive tackle premium, uh, I think you can consider him as early as 207. Uh, If it's a DT required league, um, we're talking like back half of the second round somewhere. And then if it's a combined uh, defensive line position where you've got edges and uh, defensive tackles together, I think you can actually start thinking about him somewhere in the middle of the third. That's a pretty high praise. And like you said, those are some pretty big shoes to fill, especially if you have to replace kind of Aaron Donald there. So, all right. Well, my defensive tackle uh, is also a, a very large individual, just a shade under 300 pounds. I'm going to go with Johnny Jazir Newton out of Illinois. Um, He'll just be 22 at the start of the season this year. He graded out as an 84.9 PFF grade overall in 2023. Good for sixth overall at the defensive tackle position. He played 749 snaps last season with 402 of those coming from the pass rushing spot. He had uh, 28 hurries, eight sacks, and seven more additional QB hits. He also combined for 48 combined tackles and two forced fumbles. If you want to watch some good tape on Newton, um, just watch the Wisconsin Badger game. Uh, he played against a very good offensive line, and he was still able to generate a QB hit, a sack, three tackles, and a forced fumble. So, obviously, playing against the Badgers, he had his best game of the season, like all of the Big Ten always has their best games against the Badgers. But um, with Newton, I can kind of see him going very similar to, like you said, with Murphy going in that middle of the first Um to a team like the Rams to try to replace Aaron Donald. He can also maybe go to the Dolphins to try to replace Christian Wilkinson. Um, Those would both be amazing landing spots for a player like Newton. A ton of vacated snaps to go along with that draft capital usually equals pretty good production. I could also see a team like Seattle maybe trying to sneak their way to finding him as they ranked dead last in uh, rushing yards allowed last season. So they need something to help plug plug up that middle, and Newton would definitely be a player like that. 
if he were to land in a place like the Rams, the Dolphins, or the Seahawks, I could definitely see myself spending a, a third round pick in a defensive tackle required league for a player like Newton. Um, this draft class is just too loaded with offensive pieces to, to take them any sooner than that, in my opinion. So yeah. it sounds like we were kind of on board with the same landing spots. Rams would be a great place for him. So, but like you said, you wouldn't want to do that to the poor guy trying to replace a legend like that. So. Yeah, still a great spot. So yeah, he's, I love Newton too. He's got such great hands. He's my, he's, uh, I've got to have him, I've got to have him behind um, Murphy, but uh, yeah, I like him too. I think you're you're right on there, third round. As far as uh, to put you on the spot, Jason, who do you have as your third? Then, if you got Murphy as one, Newton as two. Yeah, I've got Braden Fisk there. Okay, Uh, (laughs) it was a combine star. Uh, You know, little shorter arms. Uh, T Rex, I guess you could refer to the those that kind of arm like that. But uh, just great athlete. Um, He's he's pretty intriguing. So yeah, I've got him there as my third guy. How about you? I same. I just it seemed to be a theme of defensive tackles this year was short arms. I heard that T Rex reference a lot to all these players, and it just seemed to be if there was something wrong with them or like a negative against them, that was the thing was arm length this year. It just seemed to be a theme that for whatever reason, a lot of these defensive tackles, there if there was a negative or a, a downside red flag on them, it was arm length. So we'll see if that kind of translates to playing on Sunday. So. So after we move out of the the middle of the trenches, let's move out to the outside with the defensive ends. Jason, who's your first defensive end you want to talk about tonight? Yep. So I'm going to go with Jared Verse. Uh, He's my second dynasty edge behind uh, Turner. Uh, Verse is about 6'3", 254. He's got 33 and a half inch arms and really just had elite testing numbers to go with that uh, that size. He's uh, 4'5", 840 to go along with just really really good explosion numbers and you really see that when he comes off the line he's that guy that provides kind of that instant pop uh when you when on the snap and then you know if you've watched him you, you see him get that runway you just got to look out he just he's got that bull rush um he's got a nice long arm stick to kind of keep hands off of him uh he's got uh speed to, you know speed to power is something that typically will translate from college to the pros and he's uh that's something that really sticks out about verse is that speed to power he's just got it for days so um he does a really good job i think he's got this ability to uh, set tackles up outside and then track back inside uh he's a good tackler he's just i mean he's just a violent guy uh and I, ideally i think that i would like to see him go uh at 108 sounds high i know but i'd like to see him go 108 to the falcons and i know that's a popular landing spot for for dallas turner but i think that uh, Raheem Morris and Jimmy Lake might actually prefer the more physical edge and uh, the big three. That's that's verse. So if that happens, I could see uh, mid to late second round. Uh, that's where I would be thinking about verse in in fantasy drops. Yeah, that 108 is a really intriguing draft spot come Thursday night to see actually what happens because almost every mock draft that you see this time of year, it's a defensive end. It's you know, it, is it verse? Is it Turner? You know, or is it maybe going to be my defensive end, Latu <laughs> Latu? Um, you know, I, we all know the story about his neck and everything, but I think he checks the boxes as far as the medicals are in in the past. Any of these players can get hurt on any given play. I don't think that his neck injury um, that forced him to retire is going to be an issue for him. He's kind of checked all those medicals already. So, kind of moving past that, uh, Latu is six five, two sixty five, so he, he's built for the position. He graded out last season with a 96.3 PFF overall grade, which would have been first overall as a defensive end. In fact, that is the highest overall grade for any defensive end in the last decade, higher than Aiden Hutchinson, higher than Chase Young, and higher than Nick Bosa. So that's some pretty high praise. And you look at the three of those, and you know, outside of Chase Young, those are that's some some great landing spots for those players, but also ultra production from the defensive end spot. He had 535 snaps last season with 304 of those coming as a pass rusher. He generated 36 hurries, 15 sacks, 11 quarterback hits. He had 38 combined tackles to go along with three forced fumbles. So really, really high floor with those 38 tackles. It doesn't, he's not just sack dependent, but um, definitely offers that with the big playability for sure. 
if you watch the UCL tape, UCLA tape, he's in the backfield almost on every single play. Um, he's always there for the Bruins. Um, he's also played, you know, like I mentioned before with Newton, he played against a lot of like high end talent that uh, Pac-10 is, is a loaded conference with a lot of, a lot of NFL players. So he's playing against some really good competition week in and week out. The problem with it is it playing on the West coast. He doesn't get as much national coverage as players in the sec or the big 10 get. And so, um, if you're drafting in a league, some of your league mates might not know as much about him other than, um, just his name coming up early on Thursday night. I would like to see Latu develop another move or a pass rushing technique. He seems to kind of be more of a one trick pony, just using his speed rush. But I guess if you're going to have one trick, it's, it's a good one to have because it's obviously working for him. I just hope that he develops another move kind of going into the, to the NFL. Um, with all that said, um, I would love to see Latu go as early as eight to the Falcons, which would be ideal. Um, probably more likely to see him go to the middle of the first, maybe to the Saints at 14, um, maybe even slipping as far as like to the 26th to Tampa or 27th to Arizona. Um, I think all of those would be amazing landing spots for him. I think the Vikings make a lot of sense for him too, but I don't think the Vikings are going to have the draft capital if they make the move to move up to get a quarterback. Um, if the Vikings stick and pick, you know, with the 11 and the 23, maybe they, maybe they take a player like Latu, which would be great. So I know I threw a, a big net out there on that one. So like if they were to land on any of those spots um, with the draft capital, any of those spots have a great path to a lot of snaps. I would easily take Latu with a late second, early third. Um, he just checks all the boxes for me. So. Yeah. You're uh, well, for the listeners. Uh, I was telling Jeff right before the show started, I've already actually had one real draft. And so it's like a 14 team IDP only. Just you know, a bunch of degenerates in there. So, I had the I had the fifth overall pick, and I got on the board, and uh, I really wanted. I'm just desperate for linebackers, and so I really wanted either Wilson or Cooper, and uh, it was <laughs> Leite was right there, and I had to take Junior Colson. <laughs> I was just so <laughs> desperate for linebackers in that league, and I was just sitting there listening to him, like oh, just regretting it still. But yeah, I would, I would, I would love to see if he could. I don't. It's not good for him, but if he slipped all the way down to Tampa Bay, oh, that'd be perfect. Yeah, I, I don't see him lasting that long in the real draft. I can see a team moving up for him. I think that's the absolute floor for him. Um, come Thursday night, I just think that the talent is too too much there, and teams are desperate for that. So I can see a team moving up easily, you know, to to take him. So, yep. All right. So now we're on to your second defensive end player and this is kind of a uh, maybe like you said you're if you have to be a degenerate to know this one so who you got is your second here, here jason yeah so i wanted to go just do something a little bit different with this pick rather than just taking the top guys that everybody's heard about for a while now so i reached down to my number eight edge and my number 21 overall id idp prospect and that's austin booker out of Kansas. So uh, Booker is six foot four, two fifty three, And I got to say, if you look at him, I don't, I don't think you would guess that he's up to two fifty three. Um, so I'm assuming that he's still got the ability to pack on some additional muscle mass because he just looks kind of lean out on the field. And he's got good arm length, uh, 33 and five, eight inches. And he's really just a high upside project. I mean, he's 21 years old. Um, he's had one real season under his belt. Uh, but it was a really good season. So that season he had uh, 56 tackles. He had 13 of those tackles were for loss. He had eight sacks. What I really love about Booker is just that initial quickness off the snap and his ability to bend the edge. He can He's really quick. As I mentioned, he can get tackles to overset. And then he just cuts back or spins back inside. He's got a good uh, spin move. Uh, he's definitely a work in progress, but I think he can contribute in year one as a sub-package rusher. So... I think uh, he'd go by the end of day two, and ideally, I think uh, I'd like to see him on that aggressive Dan Quinn defense in Washington, uh, which should be able to get him those sub-package snaps during his rookie season. So Washington has picks 78 and 100 there in the back half of the third round. So I'm going to go with, uh, how about pick 314 to the commanders for high upside Austin Booker. If that happens... Uh, yeah, this is still like a six or seventh round rookie pick if you're in 12 team leagues. But uh, if you if you've got a taxi squad that requires you only to use rookies on it, I think this is a great taxi squad stash with high upside down the line. So 
Austin Booker. That's a, a great name to throw out there too, you know, especially for those deeper leagues. So I'm glad you mentioned the idea of a taxi squad because this player I have is kind of a little bit deeper, a little bit of a, a dart throw, not probably more of an upside player than Booker is, but uh, Jonah Ellis out of Utah is my second defensive end. Uh, he's 6'2", 246, so he's got some some room to grow a little bit. He just turned 21 as well, so he's got he's basically just still a kid. Um, he had an 85.3 PFF grade last season, good for 10th overall amongst all defensive ends. He had 573 snaps. Of those, 334 of them came as a pass rusher. He generated 24 hurries, 13 sacks, two more quarterback hits, 23 combined tackles, one force fumble, and two batted balls in just 10 games. So um, a little bit of everything from him. Um, I do like seeing that he's not just a, a sack heavy or sack dependent player, but he still was able to contribute in the tackle game with 23. So that per- insulates his um, play a little bit, gives him a little bit higher floor. Another thing to like Ellis is he grew in his efficiency rating in each of the last three seasons. Um, he's got an extremely fast first step. He's at the point of attack every single play. He literally plays like his hair is on fire every single play. He's running players down the sidelines, um, downfield, which is something that coaches just love to see. Something I don't think you can really coach. He's just he's just in on every single play. Um, Ellis makes a lot of sense for an NFL team, in my opinion, for a day two pick, either late second, early third. Um, any team could use a player like this, um, but I really like him on a landing on a team that doesn't need him to be the number one right away, but he could really excel playing opposite of a, an established number one, like a player like Miles Garrett in Cleveland. I know that they're drafting somewhere around the 50, 60s or 70s right there. That'd be an ideal spot for him somewhere. He can play opposite of him. Um, a few picks later, he can go to Detroit and play opposite Aiden Hutchinson. Or my favorite spot, even a few picks later than that, is in Buffalo when to play opposite of Greg Rousseau. Um, Buffalo just needs to do something to generate some pass rush. Um, they've let their uh, pass rush evaporate over the last few seasons, especially down the stretch and into the playoffs. So Ellis would be a really solid player and a pick to take a chance on with a fourth or fifth round pick in a uh, on a team with 53 man rosters or even like a taxi squad, like you mentioned. So, yeah. and he will not be the last Utah player we mentioned tonight. So, <laughs> no, he won't. No, yeah, I like I like that pick. I like Ellis. Um, I watch him, and I think a little bit of Alex Highsmith with the Steelers. I don't know. If, I don't know if you see that at all. Uh, yes. I typically don't like. I typically do not like comps at all uh, because I think it's not very fair to the prospect, and people think that okay, this guy's going to be, you know, Alex Highsmith. That's not really what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, I, I like him too. Uh, that's a good one. To, that's a good one to pick. And I, I know you mentioned Buffalo, but gosh, <laughs> I don't want to get somebody in that rotation. <laughs> I think that I think my my idea with Buffalo is that they have a lot of the same players, and I think Ellis is different than the players that they already have. So they have just this this pool of all the same players, aging veterans that can't get anything done. And I just think you know somebody with a high motor like Ellis can just come in and play opposite of Rousseau, and you know kind of maybe put Von Miller to to bed. So <laughs> yeah, I think he's ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, well, I just want to see eighty five. I want to see eighty five percent of the snaps for Greg Rousseau. <laughs> we can all dream. We can all. Yeah. Dream. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've got some pass rush on the quarterback and we've applied some pressure to them, let's go ahead and uh, put some pressure on the wide receivers. I know that maybe Johnny the Greek could do an entire episode on quarterbacks, but uh, Jason for the brand, we're going to attempt our best. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna attempt. Uh, yeah, I feel like subbing in. Spot. Yeah, just feel like subbing in uh, Johnny the Greek here. But uh, I'm gonna go with Mikey Sainry still. So the first thing on Sainry still is he's five foot nine. He's got sub thirty one inch arms. So uh, this is probably not an outside corner uh, with those concerns about his length. Uh, but that's fine because he's a slot defender, and uh, we're not we're probably not gonna ask him to move outside. Uh, at the pros, um, he's only played two seasons on defense. He converted from receiver, but you wouldn't really know it by watching him. He really looks the part. If you love uh, physical inside corners, you're really going to love this guy. Uh, he's and you probably saw him. Maybe Michigan was on TV yeah, a couple times yeah, this year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a big hitter. Um, he's aggressive to the ball when working downhill. 
Uh, he really showed the ability to quickly read what was in front of him and then break on it. Six interceptions as a senior. Uh, took two of those to the house. And uh, I think he's probably a popular pick uh, to the Chargers toward the end, toward the beginning of the second round, getting re- reunited with Harbaugh, uh, setting that new uh, culture there for the Chargers. But uh, I'm going to go Homer here. Uh, this is Mike Hilton all over again. And so I really want to see him go to the Steelers at 219. They're desperate for anything in the slot. Um, they really don't have anything right now. They'll probably have to go resign like a Chandon Sullivan or something like that if they don't come out of the draft with an instant starter. So um, keep in mind, you know, this is still this is still a corner. So uh, even if he goes there in the second round, either to the Chargers or the Steelers or some similar good spot, uh, fantasy drafts, I'm not going to reach. But uh, I could still see myself scooping him up in round seven or so in a best case scenario with Mikey Sainer still. Yeah. And, and just, you know, like you mentioned too, just for the cornerbacks is never to, to reach on corners or safeties, but just kind of let them come to you, take them with your last pick in the draft, maybe get them through a pickup on free agency and stuff like that. There's no reason to kind of overexpose yourself, you know, unless it's a cornerback required league with the scoring heavily favor favoring them. So. Yeah. And I like to target even, you know, it, I play in cornerback required leagues. I like to try to target those slot guys. You know, they play a lot closer to the to the ball. They're up on the line. They're playing in the box. Uh, it's just that kind of nice, safe uh, tackle place to be. So always want to look at slots. You've got a much better chance of hitting on somebody that's a good fantasy player if you're if you're looking inside. Well, speaking of a player that's probably going to play a lot of slot, or he pretty much mm-hmm. can play anywhere. Um, this is kind of a layup pick on my part as far as which cornerback I'm going after, but I'm going to go after Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Um, you have to be living under a rock not to have heard this guy's name by now in the drafts. He's uh, graded out. Basically, if you looked at his grade on PFF, he had a 77.4, which you wouldn't be like, wow, that's outstanding. But um, he just does so many things on the defensive side of the ball. He really can play anywhere uh, on, the, on the back end of the defense. He plays in the slot, inside, outside. He can play safety. He's a returner. So he just has so much added value as a chess piece for a real NFL team. That's why he's probably going to be like a mid to late first round pick come Thursday night. Uh, last season at Iowa, he had 705 snaps. He played 317 of those snaps in run defense. He played 388 in pass coverage. And so he really was like kind of all over the place. He did have two inter- two interceptions. Um, he only allowed, he was a top 15 for reception rate against him. He only allowed 43.5%. And that was uh, amongst all corners who played more than 400 snaps. So, you know, he was on the upper end of all the corners in college football last season. Um, he'll be an interesting name to track come Thursday night, not only for who drafts him, but how they're going to deploy him. Um, you know, with a team playing, is he going to be a straight, strictly a corner? Is he going to be a slot guy? Is he going to be a safety is a team going to roll him out in all three of those positions? Um, if they do keep him inside and outside in the slot, you know, he's kind of in the mold of that Trent McDuffie type player. Um, but if they do kind of roll him out as a safety as well, he kind of becomes that Kyle Hamilton type player where he's kind of moving all over, which as we've seen, Kyle Hamilton is fantastic for IDP scoring. So definitely a, a name to keep an eye on not only where he gets drafted, but who he's drafted by just because how they're going to deploy him. Um, with that said, I would love to see him wearing the green and gold at pick 25 for the Packers. Um, they just have a thing about drafting high RAS score guys. And DeGene had a 9.89 RAS score, which makes him an elite player, which would be a cornerstone defender and Jeff Halfley's new defense he'd like to install. Um, if he doesn't play for the Packers, I guess it's okay to see him maybe playing in Buffalo or Philly, maybe even Detroit. Um, if he does land in one of those spots late Thursday night, I could see him making a lot of sense in the fourth round of an of a draft, um, especially in a league that requires cornerback required leagues. Um, and if your league re- rewards for return yards, there might be an added bonus for him there. So um, again, just make sure that you know your league's scoring and settings because you know a player like Cooper DeGene could be a, a cheat code for you. So. Good, good to know we both went uh, with Homer picks uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say Green Bay. <laughs> He's been mocked there a lot. Like if you yeah, look at any like I'm mock sure. drafts, like it's a, it's almost like an auto. It's almost like the Joe Alt of 
<laughs> cornerbacks like them taking him. Like Joe Alt is definitely going to be a Tennessee Titan come Thursday night. So, <laughs> so, all right. Well, I hope somewhere Johnny the Greek is smiling because hopefully we didn't do it as good as he could. But you know, we, he's, he's like Charles. We're only human. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, right. He would have been on like the his 84th cornerback in the in his leagues and stuff like that. So. All right. Well, let's go to a position we probably can do a little bit better with. We'll stick with the secondary. Jason, who is a safety that has caught your eye this past college football season and through the the combine process? Yeah, so he, he didn't – this guy did not catch my eye during the season because I, I typically don't even stay up this late, even on a Saturday night. But, yeah, Jaden Hicks out of Washington State, he's my top-ranked fantasy safety. Six foot two, 215 pounds. He's got good size. He's a guy who can cover some ground in the open field. Uh, I wouldn't want him as a single high, but he's fine as a split safety or an in-the-box safety because he's just got that size and he likes to play physically. Uh, He's got uh, middle of the field uh, enforcement attitude, so I really like that. He kind of reminded me in a way of uh, Brian Cook coming out of Cincinnati with just that guy that just seems to enjoy hurting other people, uh, which you'd love to see in a safety. Uh, he's fairly versatile, can match up in man at times. Uh, that uh, that one interception, if you saw it against Washington, that was a play that opened some eyes because he carried the receiver down the field. can't remember which one it was. It might have been Polk. Uh, he never got stacked on that. Uh, he was able to make a play on the ball. So that, that one play probably made him some money at the next level. But personally, uh, I think I'd like to see him go to the Giants there at 215. Uh, everybody knows Big Blue has a – Big hole at safety following the departure of Xavier McKinney to your Green Bay Packers. And I personally don't think that Jason Pinnock or Dane Belton is the answer for the Giants to replace McKinney. So like him, like him going to uh, big blue there. And uh, if he goes there, I can see looking at him in the fifth round of a 12 team rookie draft, uh, which probably means I'm not going to get him because somebody's going to overpay for a safety before he reaches me there. So yeah, I think he'd think he'd be a good fit there in New York. And you just it kind of was funny that you mentioned it too, like you didn't stay up to watch him play. Do you feel, Jason, that sometimes uh players are overlooked because they don't have that national exposure, like players in the SEC or Big Ten who are playing more primetime games, but they get that West Coast treatment? Uh, I could definitely, I mean, that's, that's a good argument to make once you, you know, particularly when we're kind of starting out in the process of, you know, shifting from college football over to, uh, you know, prospect mode. But I think by this point in time, most people know about Hicks. It's just sure. one of those things that a lot of people, it takes time to kind of catch up to it and, uh, you know, actually watch some, uh, you know, games <laughs> of this guy yeah. play. Yeah. Like, like, you know, I, I'm up early most days, so I don't. I cannot stay up late and watch <laughs> uh, West Coast football starting at 10:30 at night. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. Like we talk about players that we're familiar with and stuff like you know. So if you were in a in a, a situation where you're going to draft player A who you watch and you knew in college, or player B who is a, a West Coast team like Hicks, you know, I wonder how often the casual drafter is going to draft someone. To, I'm going to take what I know versus the unknown. You know. I'll, you know, so it'll just be interesting to kind of maybe have that argument sometime just to see how, how biases kind of play into that draft strategy. Oh, they no doubt do. It might, it might, you might hear one of mine coming up later. <laughs> oh, well, good. Well, good. That was not intentional, not an intentional segue, by the way, but that oh, was I thought you were a, setting that up. <laughs> oh, I, okay. Then I was, then I was totally intentional. So, well, speaking of a player I have seen a lot of over this uh, college seasons. And actually I've seen him play for five years at safety is Tyler Newbin from Minnesota. Uh, Newbin played for five years for the Gophers. He took advantage of the, the COVID season. So he was able to play five seasons for them. Um, he's six two two ten, So he's like that prototypical box safety. Um, he played really, really physical for his size. He had an 89.2 PFF grade. He had 768 snaps, 341 of them in run defense. 414 in pass defense. So he's kind of all over. He did have uh, 282 of his snaps in the box. So he's kind of a very versatile player in out back end and the front. So he's going to kind of be all over the field for a, a team. He did have 58 combined tackles last season, a sack and five interceptions, which is, you know, that Kevin Byard type 
you know, ball, ball skills. He did only allow a 43.5% catch rate at the safety position. So that's pretty fantastic if he's lining up against tight ends and running back. So definitely a need for that in the NFL, especially with, with the new NFL kind of the way it's going. You got to be able to cover those safety or those tight ends and running backs coming out of the backfield. Um, so again, you know, Newbin being another Big Ten player, clearly watching way too many Badger games. Um, but he was a player I've been impressed with for a couple seasons now. Very athletic, great ball tracking skills, like we mentioned with those five interceptions. Um, he might struggle against the faster um, wide receivers as um, he doesn't take always the best angles. But I don't know if that's something that can be coached up, you know, especially if he's going to play a little more deep safety. They can kind of maybe take some better angles at. Um, to me, Newbin seems destined to be an early draft or early day two pick. Probably the first safety off the board to a team like your, like you mentioned, the Giants. I could see the Jets taking a stab on him, um, even like the Titans or, you know, I hate to be a buy- homer again, but like even the Packers have a need at safety, even though they did get Xavier McKinney. I think that Tyler Newbin would be a great compliment to him um, where McKinney can kind of play more towards the box and Newbin can play a little bit deeper safety. Um, getting that kind of draft capital along with the, the, the path, the snaps for one of those four teams, I could see Newbin being worth a late fourth, early fifth round pick for a team needing uh, a, to bolster their secondary on their team. So. Yeah. I like, I like Newbin a lot. He's, he's my second guy behind Hicks. All right. He, well, yeah, he, he would look good for the pack too. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to just say that you're, I'll have you back on the show anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> oh no, don't be, don't be. Uh, it's probably the other way around. I probably have to cap, keep you happy. <laughs> oh my. All right. So All right. we got two two safeties off the board. Who do you got for your second safety? Yep. So this is my uh this is actually my third ranked overall safety, and it's Javon Bullard out of Georgia. Um third on my list, but I have to say, this guy is first in my heart. I just freaking <laughs> love this guy. I mean, he's only five ten, he weighs a shade under two hundred pounds. But you watch him. Uh, the first thing that pops on Bullard is just the ability to read and react quickly. I mean, he just sees it. If he's in the free safety spot, you will see him just scream downhill once he recognizes what's going on in front of him. He's got excellent closing speed. And I, the other thing is, like, in 2022, um, he was like a lockdown slot guy. I mean, they, they played him out of the slot. So he's got that versatility about him. And I I have to. I have to admit, I kind of hate doing this, putting another uh, expectation on a guy, but I can't help but think of Antoine Winfield Jr. when I watch him. I don't, I don't know if anybody else sees that, but I did, he- I did hear. I was listening to a podcast uh, yesterday with um, Greg Cosell and Doug Farrar on it, and uh, Farrar actually made that same comp. He said he he reminded him a little bit of Winfield, so uh, I didn't feel bad uh, about that comp after I heard somebody else say it. So. Uh, I personally would like to see him go to Tennessee uh, there with a six pick in the second round. I realize that is like really high uh, for where he's projected, but I think that because he's got that versatility uh, to be able to play um, in the slot as well as free safety, uh, I think there's some potential for him to go a little higher than most people see. So Tennessee legit, as you probably know, they've got nothing next to Amani Hooker. So they really do have to add a safety. Uh, And if he goes uh, that high to a spot like that, um, somewhere that can just offer him some immediate run. Uh, I would certainly jump on him in the fifth. I would really be restraining myself in the fourth and be like, no, nope, don't do it. Don't take a safety. But <laughs> I'm, I'm getting him in the fifth. <laughs> and just playing for Georgia too, like, you know, they're, they're cranking out NFL talent in every position. So for him to be versatile and be able to play, you know, in the slot one year and play safety the next year, like that just shows like a, a high intelligence and a high trust by the defensive coordinator. So he's definitely a player that's going to be, you know, on the field, a ton of snaps. So, all right. Well, I got one less safety. Um, I mentioned before we weren't going to have only one Utah player. And so here's our second Utah player on the board tonight. And it's Cole Bishop. He's 6'2", 207. Again, he's kind of that very prototypical safety size. Um, He graded out as a 65.6 PFF grade in 2023. He had 587 snaps. He played 740 back in 2022. And um, of those snaps this season, so he's definitely going to play a lot of snaps. But this season of the 587 that he played, 
222 came in run defense and 329 came in coverage. So he's a very versatile linebacker or safety once again. Um, he's super athletic. He posted the highest RAS score at the combine with a 9.88, um, best among all safeties in this draft. He had a great senior bowl. He, he was all over the field making plays against uh, running backs and safe, or tight ends in that game. With that, I think he may have risen his stock enough to be sneaking in the back end of the second round, more likely the top of the third. Um, but again, we see these same landing spots, uh, Packers, Giants, the Bills, the Titans, even the commanders who lost Cameron Curl could all be really great landing spots for a player like Bishop. So if that were to happen, um, I think he's one of the few true box safeties in this draft. And like you mentioned earlier, Jason, we want those players playing close to the line of scrimmage making those tackles, which increases their floor. So if he were a player that landed in one of those spots, um, getting a second or third round draft capital, I would be really happy walking away with him in the fifth round um, as a player to, to, to stash or even just to hopefully roll out as the season goes on. So yep. yes, sir, we are. Thank you for not t- talking about Sione Vaki. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Well, the is he a running back or is he uh <laughs> he's all above? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. So we are on to the cream of the crop. If uh you've been listening to the show for the last 35 minutes, you you made it to the reason you listen to every IDP show, and that is the linebackers. Uh with this one, Jason, we're gonna go through our th- top three, uh, or not, I guess not our top three necessarily, but three prospects each for the linebacker position and where we'd like to see them go. And like you said, you already had a, an IDP draft. And by the time you got to draft at number five, two of the linebackers were already selected, right? That's right. Well, let's yep. talk about one of those that were probably already selected. And it's probably your boy, Peyton Wilson. <laughs> it is my guy. Yeah. My yep. guy from NC state. Hey, I don't know if anybody meant, if anybody noticed, but we had uh, both the men's and women's teams in the uh, final four. <laughs> Yeah, I got to mention that because it's been you know forever since I was able to talk about that. Uh, but yeah, I uh, love Wilson. Um, he's my number two linebacker. Uh, don't know why I don't have him number one. I should, but he's my number two guy. Uh, he's my number two no, overall IDP prospect. I saw that uh, Mike Wollert had him as first overall. So nice job, Mister Green Dot. <laughs> uh, I love Wilson. I mean, he's got he's got good size, almost six four, two thirty three. Of course, lit up the combine as expected. If you watched him play, uh, you just watched him run sideline to sideline. We all knew he was fast. Uh, he's a high effort guy. He's a team leader. He's smooth in coverage. He can carry back some tight ends and man. He's a good tackler. He can rush the passer. He's really just kind of a do it all linebacker. And of course, the concern is the medical history. So he's had Two, at least two major knee injuries. Uh, he's had surgeries on both shoulders. I'm not sure how many surgeries he had, but uh, it, it was, I think, at least three. Uh, but all that said, uh, he really came back. He played the best football of his career in 2023. So, you know, uh, Jeff and I were talking a little bit before the show about you, you we're really going to find out uh, on Friday uh, how those medicals look. Because if, if, he's, if we get to the end of the third round and he's still on the board, it's bad. I don't, I don't expect that to be the case. Uh, I really think that uh, he's probably going to go in, uh, in the second round. Um, but it's just going to be hard to predict. So I would say ideally and realistically, um, he's there at like 225 for Tampa Bay. You know, the Bucks have, of course, uh, Levante David, who justifies age, uh, even though I know that Father Time does eventually catch up with everybody. He's still going strong. They've got uh, David and they've got KJ Britt. They're both on one-year deals. They've also got last year's rookie, Sarasia Dennis. Uh, but uh, Tampa's, Tampa's going to have to take a look at this position in short order. So I'd, I think I'd really love to see him go there. And I've, I've seen him mocked uh, to Dallas, and my daughter would not be happy with me if I picked him to Dallas here. So I'm not going to do that if she's watching. So um, if he comes off uh, the board, as long as he goes on Friday, really, uh, I'm looking at him in the mid to late second round of rookie drafts. You know, I think that's something, too, that's often overlooked is the draft capital that teams invest in these players, too. It's it's not just that they go to a team, but it's when they go to a team. And if that team moves up to get them, you know, that just kind of really shows their value of the player. But then also like, like you said, like the, those medicals come back 
clean. If a team is willing to move up, you know, like fr- from a late second to early second to draft like a Peyton Wilson, you know, that, that obviously he's checked all the medicals for that team and he's, he was probably a pretty safe investment. So just for your daughter's sake, we hope it's not the Cowboys that move up. No, geez, me, so for my sake, too. <laughs> oh, for you. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm going to move on to my linebacker um, to chat about. I love Wilson, but the second linebacker probably off everyone's board or most people's boards is going to be Edrian Cooper out of Texas A&M. Again, 6'3", 230. He's definitely got that build for him. Last season at uh, in 2023, he graded out at 90.8, a PFF grade. He was the number one ranked linebacker across the board at 609 snaps. 254 of those were run defense, 272 in coverage, and he had 83 pass rushing snaps. So he's a little bit of everything last season. Um, He scored really, really well in all areas. Uh, 87.6 in run defense, 86.4 in pressure, 85.5 in coverage. So really there's nothing that he can't do for an NFL team. And that's clearly why he's probably the second option, 1A or 1B to Peyton Wilson in many many, um, rankings right now. I did notice a couple times in uh, watching him play, he gets a little over aggressive in pass rush. And I don't know if that's something that it was coached for him to do like on certain plays, but he sometimes took himself out of plays because he was um, just over aggressive on some of those plays. So I don't know if that's something that that was his role in the defense on Texas A&M. Um, but he looked great at the combine. He had a four, five, two forty, which was faster than he needs to be in for the NFL. I don't think there is a first round grade on any linebacker this year, either between Wilson or Cooper. So I expect their names to be called early on day two. Um, Several teams fit the bill. I love the Cardinals at 35 who have no one at linebacker. The Chargers at 37 make a lot of sense um, as they moved on from Eric Hendricks. You mentioned Tennessee at 38 would be a great one. And then I wouldn't be a Packer fan if I didn't mention him going to Packers at 41. So um, if Cooper would happen to land on any of those spots early day two, uh, it would be really tough to pass him in the second round of a rookie draft. Um, I think he'd be a solid contributor day one if he landed on any of those teams. So Cooper for me, round two, sign me up. Yeah, like it. I um, I can't. Here's what I'll say about Cooper. Well, he is my number one prospect. I feel like I almost feel about Cooper like I felt about Drew Sanders last year, who I loved. <laughs> and then he got moved. <laughs> he couldn't cut it. <laughs> he got yep. moved to edge. <laughs> so I, I'm hoping that doesn't happen with Cooper. But, uh, you know, he is kind of, you know, he's kind of high cut. He's leggy. Um, I don't I don't know. I have a little bit of concern with him. But I think the upside is so great if he goes to the right spot. I th- he, I've still got him as my top linebacker. It's funny because – now that you may say that, like Drew Sanders was at this time last year, he was probably two, three ranked linebacker, probably across the board, you know, uh, behind Jack Campbell. And then he just had a season that just never materialized or anything. They kind of were moving around a defensive end. And, you know, I know we mentioned this on our mock draft we did back in March, but could a team draft Cooper as a defensive end? Like, is that, is that out of the realm of possibility? Yeah. I mean, Personally, I think probably so. I don't think he's really – I don't think he's got that in his background. It's not like Sanders where he was, you know, converted um, in college uh, to off-ball. But it, it's possible that it ends up being his best fit. I, I don't know. Oh, we're starting to worry me a lot now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not, now all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, maybe uh, – well, all right. So, well, that will be a discussion after Thursday night once we know where he goes. So, that will tell us a little bit. So, all right, let's get on to our third overall or our third linebacker prospect. Jason, who do you have for your next one? Yeah, so um, I'm going to go with uh, talk about Cedric Gray, uh, even though he's out of uh, uh, the rival UNC Chapel Hill there. He's got good size. He's 6'1", 234. He's got, he had good testing numbers. A really, really good 35 and a half inch vertical jump. And if you watched him, uh, drop in zone and then pick off the pass uh, in the senior bowl. You saw that you saw that leaping ability. So he's also a pretty good tackler. Uh, he does a pretty good job of keeping himself clean and then working downhill versus both the run and on the blitz. Uh, he's good enough speed to chase guys down laterally. 
Uh, but like I mentioned on that uh, pick that he had in the senior bowl, his strength is really in zone coverage, which I think is going to have him drafted uh, on day two. So he does a great job of moving with the quarterback, um, seeing where seeing where the quarterback's eyes are. He's keep, he keeps his feet moving. Uh, and then when the ball comes his way, he really – he really explodes, uh, and he had ended up with like five interceptions at UNC last season. So this is we talked enough about the Packers, but this is this is where I put uh, Cedric Gray. I sent him over to Green Bay um, at number one, number number ninety one overall uh, there toward the end of the third round. So I, I think it's a pretty good spot. You know, year one he could battle for snaps with Isaiah McDuffie. Um, and McDuffie's only got like a, a year left on his rookie deal. And I don't think Mc, I like McDuffie okay, but I don't think he's going to make Pro Bowl anytime soon. So it's not an insurmountable object there in his way if he ends up there. Um, but if that happens in fantasy drafts, um, I'm definitely uh, considering him in the fourth round of a 12 teamer. And I know one player we haven't mentioned yet, and we're not going to talk about him, but it's Junior Colson too. He's a he's a player that is definitely in this realm of linebacker rankings. He's probably three, four for a lot of people in their rankings. Um, but we couldn't talk about everyone. But he's definitely a player kind of in the st- same range. You know, a lot of the same teams are teams that are going to be targeting him. He's going to be one of those players that. You know, if he gets drafted to one of those spots, he's going to be a second round rookie pick, maybe a third. So. Somewhere in there, so yeah, and just I mean, Colson too, just like Gray. I mean, they honestly, if you want to knock them for something, like they both tackle high. Like I've, seen, this is something that I think is a little bit concerning. It it definitely impacted uh, Gray's tackle rate at UNC. It didn't seem to impact Colson's tackle rate, but I I would be a little bit concerned about that as something that they need to clean up as they transition. in. it's just it's a recipe for missed tackles. Maybe they're worried about the hip hip tackle. Yeah, <laughs> the hip <laughs> drop. <laughs> that could be. Tackle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I'll just smother the guy, cover him like a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, jokes aside, do you think that's something that can be coached up at the at the NFL level? Uh, it's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say you would hope so. That's, that's that's really about all I can say. Never having okay. <laughs> had to uh, adjust my uh, tackle angle on somebody. <laughs> sure. But, but I, if I it were to happen, you'd... you'd like to think that you could be taught or coached up oh, how to do course. it. Yeah, there you go. yeah, I'm totally open to coaching. You're a coachable um, guy, though, Jason. You're a coachable I mean, guy. I'm sure Colson and Gray are, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'd like to think that, so. All right. I have um, – th- my, my next linebacker is someone who is like – just really starting. I'm really starting to warm up to a lot uh, more tape that I watched. Started seeing him kind of go through the combine, uh, and that's Trevion Wallace out of Kentucky, uh, three-year player out of Kentucky, six-two, two forty-one. So he's got that build. He only had a sixty-one point one PFF grade in twenty twenty-three, which is a little like mm, not so great. But I think he played way better than his numbers would indicate. He played six hundred and sixty-eight snaps. He played 275 of those in run defense, 232 in pass coverage, while having 71 more in pass rush. So he's kind of doing it, do everything there. He truly has sideline to sideline speed very quick. Um, we saw the explosiveness when he had a 10.7 broad jump at the combine. He had a 37 inch vertical. So he's clearly an explosive player. Um, he can get out of the way of blocks and he can shed those pretty well. So I do want to see him use his hands a little bit better. Um, once he gets into the offensive lineman, he gets a little tangled sometimes, but I'm not sure if that was more of the scheme that he was running or if uh, in the NFL, he can just kind of play a true linebacker, maybe playing that weak side where he's going to be covering the the running backs and tight ends coming out there. So um, Wallace did have 77 tackles and five sacks in just 12 games at Kentucky last season. So he, he definitely has a high floor with the tackles, but he's also can make those splash plays happen. I really like Wallace as a late uh, day two pick to a team like the Chargers, the Bucks, like you mentioned, or even like the Lions, who are maybe trying to look at a Derek Barnes replacement. Um, I know that the Packers brought him in for a visit this past few weeks, but everyone is bringing everyone in. So I don't know if that's anything to kind of be um, alarming, but, you know, it's, it's Packer news, so I got to let you know about that. So. Hey, it's the only way to get people to visit Green Bay. <laughs> oh, ouch, Green ouch, ouch, ouch. Well, next year, everyone will be there for the draft, so it'll be a different story. <laughs> So uh, Wallace is my linebacker five right now on the board. Um, with that later round draft capitalist uh, late second day, 
I think he makes a great stash in the fourth round. Um, as your LB6, someone who you can roll out later in the season once injuries happen to your team, um, once they happen in the NFL, but also to kind of get you through those bye weeks. So I think Wallace landing in one of those spots would be a, a, a great stash for your roster. So, Yeah, I struggle. I struggle with Wallace. Uh, I don't, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to own any shares of him. I, he's like serious, like probably maybe the best athlete at linebacker in this draft. I just... I don't think he knows what he's doing. So <laughs> I'm going to pass on him. <laughs> well, he, he can get there fast. So whatever he yeah, doesn't yeah. know what to do, he's going to get there fast. So he, he could recover. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Maybe we'll just get the assisted tackles everywhere. So just got to make sure we watch uh, who the good assisted tackle scoring teams are for the, for the league. So <laughs> yeah, that's another episode. Takes those false steps. He can recover. He's got the speed to do that. <laughs> All right, Jason, you're going to kill me. You got another Big Ten oh, player, geez. another Big Ten player to talk about tonight. So. Oh, no. Yeah, it's 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 Tommy. It's a player a lot of people don't like, but yeah, it's Tommy Eichenberg out of Ohio State. Got good size for a modern linebacker. He's 6'2, 233. I would say that he really surprised me at the combine with the short shoulder run that he had, 424. Um, I actually like him a good bit. He's he's a guy who's just he seems to be always around the ball. Uh, does a good job of shedding blockers and not getting closed out of plays. Uh, he's good at making plays in the backfield. He had 11 and a half TFLs in 2022. He had 20 and a half tackles in the backfield for his career. And uh, it's not really fair, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. I kind of liken him to a guy like TJ Edwards in that uh, I didn't really appreciate Edwards as a prospect. Um, but I've kind of come around on those types of linebackers who they just know where to be. Uh, they they can read what's in front of them and they they can play gap sound defense, um, you know. So I, I think that there's a chance he's more than a two down linebacker, uh, just because he knows what he's doing and he's reliable. Now, yes, he's terrible. He drops into coverage and you're like, eh, I don't want to see that anymore. Um, so I would hope that he's able to improve in that area and eventually round into, um, you know, a, a three down guy. So. Ideally for me, uh, I think the Cardinals snatch him up kind of toward the end of day two there at uh, pick 90 overall, uh, just because I think he can operate as Arizona's third linebacker in year one. And then, you know, possibly be the top guy in year two, assuming Kaiser White plays out his contract and then moves on. Um, so if he goes on Friday, uh, I'm probably looking at him as early as the fourth round, but probably not. I'm probably going to look at him in the fifth. And I uh, feel pretty good that uh, he'll be there for me then. When has the Ohio State had a, a good NFL linebacker <laughs> outside of James Laurinaitis? Like, well, Shazier was really good for the Steelers. Uh, you know, obviously suffered that terrible yeah. injury, yeah, um, right? But yeah, he was he was I feel like just in line to be one of the great ne- uh, next greats for the line for the Steelers at linebacker. Yeah, Ohio State always seems to like pump out a lot of like NFL caliber linebackers for sure. There's every year there seems to be the next one in the draft. So, yeah. Well, I'll mention TJ Edwards for you. Yeah. It, but he's you just, came he around on him. You came around. He, yeah. He was a Wisconsin guy, right? Am I wrong yep. about that? Okay. Yep. Nope. There you go. Yeah. And I actually, uh, there's been a badger run on linebackers like the last couple of seasons between Edwards and then uh, the boys that went to Pittsburgh and stuff like that. So, Got a starting a linebacker factory, you know, like a, we got tight end factories, we've got offensive line factories, and now we've got a linebacker factory. So, well, I got one last linebacker for you, and uh, it's going to be Jalen Ford out of Texas. Um, this is a player who you are probably not going to take in any of your first few rounds of your draft. This is definitely going to be a, a late round, last round. Um, stash for you on your rosters. Uh, he had a 67.2 PFF grade in 2023. He had 797 snaps. He had 291 of those in run defense, 421 in pass coverage, and 85 in pass rushing. So he had a great um, stats for his two first two full seasons as a starter at Texas. He had 78 combined tackles in 2023 and 95 in 2022. I see him as kind of a, a twitchy downhill player. 
It's got better than average athleticism. Um, he's not afraid to stick his nose in the in and on a tackle, which shows up in how many assisted tackles that he has. He has almost as many assisted tackles as he does solos. So if your league is uh, an assisted tackle league, that where you get that, you know, Jalen Ford might be your guy. Um, I sometimes see that his twitchiness sometimes causes him to over pursue on plays. Um, he takes some bad angles on a couple uh, routes, especially uh, covering t- athletic tight ends. Um, so maybe that's something that can be coached up, um, maybe taking some better angles and things like that. But um, to me, Ford seems destined to be a day three pick, which means he could literally be drafted by anyone. I would love to see him going to a team like maybe the, the Cowboys later on um, or even like the Falcons on a day three pick um, somewhere where he has an opportunity, maybe a clear path to play with some with some coaching. Maybe an injury happens to somebody in front of him. We've seen players like Ford become relevant. Um, you know, you mentioned Wisconsin linebackers before, like Jack Sanborn kind of is that same type of player. He went to the Bears. There was no chance for him to play. Injuries occurred. And all of a sudden, Jack Sanborn for about five or six weeks became very fantasy relevant until he got an injury of his own. So I, I kind of see Jalen Ford is in that kind of mi- mindset where, you know, I could take him in the fifth or sixth round of my my draft, stick him on the end of my roster. And if, you know, he lands in one of those situations where an injury happens and he becomes a plug and play player for me down the down the stretch so be it so that's where i kind of got mr ford there so yeah i think there's going to be a lot of guys like ford when that are going to go off the board in day three and toward the end of drafts we're all just going to start taking swings on some of these guys you know you're going to get two or three of them and then you're just going to hope that you know one of them has some fantasy value at some point over his rookie season and then you're going to try to sell it <laughs> so is there a player jason like that you know, maybe we didn't mention tonight that you kind of like more so than maybe the consensus and it doesn't have to be at any, any one particular spot. Is there any positional player that you find is like, you've going to probably own a lot of shares of. Sure. Uh, probably so. I would say like, I'd, I'm not from like top to bottom, like this is probably not like an IDP class that I'm going to go out of my way to get guys. And so typically in a, in a draft like this, I'm, I'm going to take a lot of swings at receiver in particular here, uh, just like everybody else wants you know, yep. to get their hands on as many of these receivers as possible. I would say if I'm just you know, getting a guy that uh, you know, is probably going to go late and you know, I'm just going to get shares of him just because I kind of like him. It's uh, Darius uh, Muasu. I, th- I hope I'm saying that right. I think I'm close, at least. That's uh, out of UCLA. Uh, I just I think he, he's good in pursuit. Um, he's a guy that I think if he gets on the field um, and sees some snaps, that uh, he can he can get some tackle numbers on the board. And uh, you know, he's just another one of those linebackers that uh, I'm I'm probably willing to take a few shots on uh, as we get toward the end of drafts, provided he actually gets drafted <laughs> and we actually see him coming off the board on Saturday. So I don't, do you, do you have anybody that, uh, that you really like and you're, you're going to get a lot of shares of? I probably will. Cause I, I've done, and this isn't a, this is a humble brag, but I'm drafting really late in a lot of my drafts. So I'm going to be at the back end of a lot of these rounds and stuff like that. So like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, don't tell my league mates that, but, um, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to probably have a lot of uh, shares of the the kid from Washington and his name has more vowels in it than consonants The Elifosano, something like that. It's, yep. it wouldn't be very good at uh, Scrabble because it, the vowels aren't worth a lot, but I think he's like, he's probably going to be one of those players that I have a lot of just because he's going to go late. Uh, kind of a unknown prospect at this time. You don't see him in a lot of player or, yeah. pre-draft ranking top tens anywhere. So he's yeah, probably a good player. I've got. Yeah. He, he's fun to watch too. You know, one of those guys that just kind of flies around hair on fire, yep. gets to the ball really quick. Um, do you, as long as he do you know how to pronounce free. his name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he goes by Jeffrey. <laughs> Is that what? Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm going to go with poor, that. <laughs> poor guy. Poor guy. Doesn't have a chance then. So, well, Jason, this has been fantastic. Um, you know, we did our pre-draft in March. Now we've got this one coming up. We're like less than a week away. So um, thanks so much for taking your time, not only in March, but then now to kind of go through this as we've gone through and gotten a little more information on some of these prospects. We've got a little bit of insight on where they possibly could go. So 
Hopefully we hear a lot of these players' names called early on Thursday and then on Friday. You know, and if they slip to Saturday, you know, that, that's kind of a telling piece of information for us as well. So Jason, before I let you go, is there anything that you're working on right now that uh, the good listeners can check out some more of your fantastic work? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I just finished up a piece for Dynasty League Football that's just kind of like a positional strengths of, uh, on the IDP side. So just kind of a good general roundup um, as, you, uh, as you head into uh, your, your draft watching experience. I think that'll probably come out on Tuesday. Uh, and then I'll be writing up for uh, for DLF. I'll be writing up the uh, first and second round, second and third round recaps. So those will post uh, the morning after uh, each of the rounds. Well, that's fantastic. And then I understand you're taking a little trip uh, uh, across the across the ocean here. <laughs> oh yes, Get, getting ready to uh, take my uh, pasty white complexion over to Scotland and uh, do a good bit of hiking and photography and eating myself silly and uh maybe belting back a few few scotches so there you go well deserved after all the work in the uh, pre-draft process and leading up to the draft so i'm sure you'll you'll need a little r and r i need it there's no doubt hope you can get a vacate soon <laughs> yeah we're wrapping up well we got like about uh 35 days left of school to our school year and then i have a, a son who's graduating um this year so he's going to go off oh, to wow. college so we're, we're very very treated we're going to take a trip to australia at the beginning of june for a couple of weeks so oh, nice yeah so that'll be our r and r so hope i don't get stung bitten or <laughs> poked by anything that'll kill me so i've been <laughs> watching way too many youtube clips about things that can kill you in australia so oh yeah no we can't have that happen yeah stay inside <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah, yeah so yeah. all right cool. well jason that's going to do it for this episode of the IDP After Show. Join me next time where I'm joined by a slew of guests, and we're going to do a live four-round IDP Superflex draft. I know you won't want to miss that. To be sure you don't miss that or any of the other great IDP episodes, be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and hit that notification button so you never miss an episode of the IDP Show or the IDP After Show. For Jason, I'm Jeff saying thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch up with you next time. This was the IDP After Show. <laughs>